so our next presenter uh, really doesn't need much of an introduction. Introduction. It's a uh, Chris Keegan. You probably recognize him. He's been around here a little bit. Um, so in addition to being uh, a part of this uh, conference, a part of the subcommittee on maintenance, a part of the, the partnership for our Pacific Northwest Maintenance Conference, and then also working, I'm assuming he still gets some work in there at, at WashDOT. So uh, uh, Chris is gonna be giving a presentation on It's the Money Dummy. And I'll let him uh, 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 go from there, thanks. Yeah, probably the more politically correct um, title would be Asset Management in a Constrained Budget Environment, which sounds very engineering-wise, you know. But I much prefer it's the money dummy because that's what I tell myself every day. And uh, asset management, if you don't know what that is, I'd like to tell you a little story. And I'm telling the story about my wife who's not here, so I can tell whatever I want. But when she was going to college, she was in a very constrained budget environment. Her dad had been injured. They have a small farm. You know, there was no money. So she was pretty much living on loans, Pell Grants, and Top Ramen. And so she had a asset management dilemma one day when as she pulls into the gas station, the oil light goes on. So she only had enough money, either put a few gallons of gas in or put money in for the, or buy oil and take care of that. But if she put the oil in, she couldn't go anywhere. So what are you gonna do? Well, I tell you, as a state employee for 38 years, I think we deal with that every single day. And I know Duane was talking about, you know, the areas outside of the main freight hill. You just let them go. Just like you don't put the oil in your car because you don't have the money. Sometimes you make those choices. So she had to make the choice, was she gonna get to school? Or was she gonna put oil in the car and let it sit there? You put gas in the car. So sometimes we make those choices. But what is asset management? One of the things that why I say money dummy, I'll tell you in a minute, but asset management is a strategic risk-based approach to cost effectively and efficiently manage the physical assets of your transportation system. When I saw that, something started bothering me in my head. I said, there's something missing here. And then I read through asset management. The creation of a sustainable asset management program requires data collected, stored, analyzed, an inventory of what you have, the condition of the inventory, and performance measures. Simple, easy to understand, leads to a state of good repair. The last thing, money, I added, because after I went through that, I said, that's probably the most important thing you need in all this. Eventually, you have to get the money. So without the money, you can't put the oil in the car. And if you put the gas in, it's gonna run, but eventually, your asset's gonna fall apart. So the money, you gotta know where it is, you wanna know who controls it, you gotta know how to get it, you know how to keep it, and you need to know how to get more. And data is dollars. Uh, a number of years ago, I think you'll remember Skagit River Bridge. Uh, Overheight load caused it to collapse. If you look real close, you can see the hanging gardens of the Skagit River Bridge. A lot of material kind of hanging over the side. This is before we really went full bore on our bridge cleaning program. But what this showed, and if you can see this, uh, the paint looked pretty good, except for where the dirt was. You take the dirt and everything and clean all that up. You find that the rivets are eaten away. The paint is gone. And you can tell how long the dirt was there by how much paint is left. So that kind of, we have been working on starting a bridge washing program. We have been working with our environmental permitting agencies. We had a number, we started off with four uh, bridges and we felt we could prove to them if we hand cleaned and washed the bridges that when we were done, you test the water upstream and downstream, there's very little difference and we should be able to wash bridges using that technique. Well. They said four wasn't enough, so we ended up working up to about 17 bridges on our program before they finally said, okay, since none of these showed there was really any pollution problems downstream when we flushed, they finally gave us a permit to do the work, except we didn't have the money until Skagit River came along, 
When it failed, all of a sudden it said, whoa, you need to do something. You need to clean your truss bridges. So we now are cleaning all our truss bridges. So that's pretty much what this is. Pilot program, washing bridges was already ongoing. Permitting agencies were willing to allow washing because of the data we had. Skagit River showed the effects of not cleaning steel truss bridges. We had a pilot program provided cost data. We already had the data on steel truss bridges. So we know tons, we know square foot of surface area. Dwayne's got all those in his access program. So, uh, and besides that, Federal Highways helped us out. They sent a letter to Bridge saying, truss is not clean enough for fracture critical inspection. So that helped us also. Uh, where do we stand as far as state fuel tax goes? We get 49.4 cents per gallon. We're, I think we're just below California, who just got a new gas tax increase. You're about 50.2 or something, I think. Pretty close. Um, the way we normally take our money is that how the legislatures provide us money is they work between each other and says, okay, if I get this project, will you give me this project? And so the previous gas tax, the nine and a half cent and the nickel, all went to projects. There wasn't any money for preservation or for maintenance. The new one called the Connecting Washington, there's 11.9 cents. Oh yeah, all that nine and a half and the five cents, we mortgaged all that, all went into bonds. So for the next 25 years, we'll be paying those off. Well, most of the projects are already complete, but we'll continue to pay for those until somebody said, so about a quarter of the life is gone of the projects that we built. Now 11.9, they're only going to bond about 4.9 cents. The rest is going to be cash only. So as the cash comes through, we'll use that directly. And there was a little bit of money given towards preservation and for maintenance. So connecting Washington, supposed to produce $16.2 billion, total revenue over 16 years. 4.76 of that is bond proceeds. Uh, it was given in uh, two phases, seven cents and 4.9. Uh, we went from the sixth highest gas tax to the fourth. Uh, of all our gas tax, about 8.7 goes to state and local, 1.22 highway preservation, and 100 million to highway maintenance. As people have pointed out we have fish passage barriers we have to replace. 300 million goes to that. Our facilities have been around since the Public Works Administration in many cases. They're falling apart. So they threw in $52 million to upgrade our facilities and $50 million towards traffic operations. Now, if you notice, I put an asterisk besides highway preservation and highway maintenance. If you read through what our uh, law says, Connecting Washington recognizes the importance of preserving our aging transportation infrastructure and helps make a dent in our preservation backlog. Makes a dent in our preservation backlog. $1.2 billion on state highway preservation. The new revenue investment reduces the rate at which the preservation backlog will grow. It doesn't say it gets smaller. We're going to reduce the rate at which it grows. It will improve bridges and contribute funds to maintenance and traffic operations. Are we the only state where we're doing this? No. I checked Colorado just a minute. Now, unlike us, Colorado hasn't had a gas tax increase since 1991. And what they're looking at is a, also a constrained financial environment. And their funding is uh, scheduled to curb the growth of con congestion and curb the decline in maintenance level of service. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> and right now they are in 2015, their level of service was at uh, a B minus. They're saying this year they should be down to a C plus and 2019 down to a C. And that's curbing the, the backlog in their maintenance. I think if you look at all the states, we're all pretty much in the same boat. I know Oregon is looking for additional funding. And you had your last one, I think, in 2015? 2011. Ours was 2015. The real winner out there for states that have, haven't had an increase the longest from Alaska. 
1970 was the last time they had a raise in their gas tax. Uh, the other thing that the legislature said is that uh, we're going to use practical solutions, which basically says you don't have to have six-foot shoulders, 12-foot lanes, all this. Make it fit with what works in the location. And they said any cost savings you had in the latter part of the 16-year program, you can use to fund for preservation projects. And they also threw, threw in additional capital projects in the outer years of the program. So not sure how much of that we're going to get, or if our backlog will continue to increase or not. We're hoping it won't. We're working on some other system to help use the money we have and kind of stretch it a little farther. So our bridge asset performance, percent of bridges in fair or better, goal is 90%. We're currently at 91.2. Number of bridges load posted, and Duane has done a nice job of showing that number of posted should be going down. It's actually going up, mainly because of deck condition. Steel bridge painting backlog shows we're 414 million behind. And a 10-year forecast, kind of show where we're going to go, 707 million. Decks due or past due, 115.6 million. Projected 10-year deck backlog, 727 million. And the structurally deficient NHS state bridges, its goal is under 10%. Currently, we're at 9.3. You remember last year in Utah, the intelligent ask? Uh, so things you need to do is have the data ready, know what the data says, know what you need, know what you can do, ask for the money, and then keep asking. As uh, state employees, we don't like to ask for money, but you got to. Uh, preservation, let's see, practical solution. Preservation funding to maintenance. Between a group of us, we got rid of all these silos. We actually communicate with each other. The bridge office, maintenance, our capital program development group, trying to use the money we have and come and put it in the right places. Uh, in 1719 biennium, we have six million of our preservation funds, which normally go to contract, which is going to go to maintenance. Since we figure out how to do that, uh, one of the things we couldn't use our preservation funding for is for buying equipment for the new crews. So that's going to come out of our maintenance budget. We're going to have two new crews, and the focus initially on catching up on repairs and move to a preventive maintenance plan. Uh, we got this because uh, the pavement group kind of started this first. What they would do is there wasn't enough money to do the paving on time. So they said, okay, maintenance, if you can hold this stretch of highway with dig outs, whatever, uh, crack ceiling, whatever else, we'll pay you because we know it's due now and we want to keep it there for another three, four, five years until we have enough money to actually pave it. So they, they kind of broke the ground for us. And now we're moving into the bridge part. Uh, here it is where H, hot mix asphalt, P1 or M2. It does life extension, crack sealing, dig outs, rut fills. Region maintenance crews work with materials engineer to extend pavement life. Uh, and then for contracts or overlays, chip seals and slurry seals. For concrete pavement, uh, either P1 or M2, they do crack seals, patch, rut fill, and panel replacements. And contracts go to bow bar retrofits, grind panel replacements precast or pour back in place. Bridges, either M2 or P2, clean, seal concrete, seal joints, treat timber, waterproof, remove large woody debris, scour protection, spot and area paint, earthquake retrofits, and so on. Funding to maintenance were the 1719 east side northwest bridge crews. Uh, plus, we got a bonus in Olympic and southwest region, and we haven't figured out how to do that yet because you can only add like two more people. And so how do you, you can't form a new crew. Crews are kind of right size now, so how do you fund that? So we're, so we just got the money, we're trying to figure it out. Uh, the data, bridge maintenance funding. Um, in 1517 biennium, there was a, like $28.5 million for all bridges. Uh, it was divided up amongst the regions. 
For fixed only, though, there's only about $15 million for our fixed bridges. And we had a backlog in, in uh, Priority 1 structural repairs. Uh, in 2009, we had uh, uh, 209 uh, structural repair, repairs left on July 1st. And by the July of 2016, we were up to 900, about a 330% increase in our repairs that we're not getting to. That's our backlog. And what this is, I had to project this up into uh, June 30th of this year. So that's what I did. Basically, it says we're not going to get caught up during that time. Uh, and that we need something like $23 million to get caught up. Remember, this is a subcommittee on bridges came up with this, kind of the life cycle. Uh, so where can we intervene in this life cycle to kind of help? And mainly in that fair bridge group, I think. Uh, we had some bridge uh, pilots, 167 over 32 East. That was a steel plate jointed bridge. Uh, it was scheduled for replacement in 2021 but the steel plate was breaking up in traffic, banging around. We really couldn't wait. So uh, I talked to Duane. It was scheduled to cost, or it was estimated to cost around 900,000. We said we could do it for 250 using maintenance crews. We can do that because we reduced the risk because we're not out there. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to pay the crew to do nothing. We can just send them to another job if it rains then bring them back when it's not raining. So a lot of that risk goes away. These are highly skilled people that know what they're doing out there. So that helps too. Uh, another one I have is TNB Travelers and then Beaver Creek. So the steel plate joints. Uh, what helped there too is Northwest region, right downtown Seattle, had a steel plate joint, came up a few times into traffic, always right at rush hour stopped traffic and it's and it was in the newspapers on the radio everywhere else so that also helped you know it's make use of all your disasters to get money <laughs> and and i think they said it's about a three month time period you have to do it so you got to act fast uh so we requested two hundred fifty thousand from Dwayne. we completed the work for two hundred twenty six thousand I don't know if Dwayne knows it, but we also cleaned all the brush underneath, cleaned all the caps too. Well, with that 226, we figured if we're going to seal up the joint, we might as well get all the, the caps cleaned off. We had to do underneath because if we hadn't had rain in like two months, a lot of brush under the ridge. We were uh, used flame cutting the steels. There were sparks flying everywhere, so we had to clean all the brush out before we started work. And this is what the joint looks like completed. TMB Lower Travelers, I threw this one in. It, it doesn't quite fit because we didn't actually do the work. But what it does is kind of a practical solution. Uh, this is the older Coban Harrells Bridge from 1949. Uh, it had a little travelers on the bottom. They were condemned almost immediately. They were never used. Uh, the original concept was to build these buoy, big movable travelers underneath. But it's anything like the new bridge, you can carry 500 pounds on those travelers once you put two people in. And the weight can carry about 500 pounds. So what good do they do you other than as a taxi to get you back and forth? They don't do you a lot of good. So what do the people need on the bridge? They need a painting platform. And... We had a gift from the contractor that built the new bridge, a lot of Safeway staging material, about 80% of what we needed. So what we needed to do was get permission to buy more Safeway staging material to build a platform. So that's what we did. So rather than spending 12.1 million on travelers or spending $400,000 on a painting platform, which is what we needed anyway. So big cost savings. Beaver Creek, this is, we have a couple bad bridge decks that are kind of far in the, the boondocks, but the people are very vocal about these. 
This is what I'm trying to get, get done, talking to Duane about the funding. Uh, we had a group out of Utah that has this chain rag thing that does it automatically, and they came out and they confirmed the fact that there's no good bridge deck left on this bridge. So we, it's a little bigger project we thought, and we're trying to figure out how to make it work. So asset management, you pile out the asset management elements, identify champions, communicate amongst yourselves and around. Uh, something they said was the map, map showing needs, so each legislative district knows where your needs are. Uh, make sure they're condition-based by legislative district. Show savings of all your actions and request funding to meet your goals. I threw this in, practical design for the long term. Build it for their easy, so they're easy to maintain. Uh, don't put joints in if you don't need them. Uh, if it's in the urban area, don't make condos for the homeless because uh, then you have trouble getting in. Uh, details that discourage bird nesting. Everybody has trouble with birds. Standard components that do not require keeping large inventory of parts. And bridges with sufficient clearance to prevent or over height load hits. Haven't figured out what that, what that, what that is yet. It's over 17 feet, we still get them hit. So eliminate or at least minimize skew angles and bridges. Design with protective measures where corrosive salts and or studs and chains are used in the winter. So treat concrete, I like to use this one. This was a bridge that was between New Hampshire and Vermont. New Hampshire, got this from Ed. Uh, New Hampshire used to treat their concrete. Vermont did not. That pile of rubble is the barrier when you don't treat it. The other side is what happens when you do. So it's the same bridge, built the same time, different treatments. And they just use linseed oil for their concrete treatment. Cheap, you just have to do it every couple years, I think, because with your linseed oil. Uh, I want to make sure construction, because they better build it as design. We've had a number of problems where Contract, we've had a joint put in and failed the next day. Uh, they did exactly what we told them to do, so we can't get any money from them, so we sent maintenance out and they fixed it. So Federal Highways engineer from this on bridges showing all that concrete inside boxes. That's not new, latex modified concrete when we were doing it 20 years ago. You know, they got paid 100% of the cost, up to 100%, 125, you get paid more continue to pump that latex concrete. And if the seal broke and you're pumping concrete behind your girders and everything else, nobody's checking underneath, then it all hardens up. Then maintenance has to come in two years later after the inspection and chip all that out. So construction has to look beyond just what's on the deck. Uh, make sure the work is complete, site is clean, uh, contractor dam uh, repairs all damages, as-built plans are completed. We call our as-built otter builts because half of them are wrong. Uh, asset management, there's never enough money to do it all. You have to set your priorities, ADT, critical routes. And then there are the orphans, which beyond bridges. And another one's about small dollar contracts. This is a soldier pile wall with timber lagging. Estimated life of the lagging is about 20 years. This wall is 19 years old. Uh, we don't inspect these regularly. So unless we see something going wrong, we won't know if there's a problem out there. The other thing is our sign bridges, especially the, our aluminum ones. Uh, these are failing right and left, so we're focusing our inspections on those. And how do we maintain these? We take them down. And then we put a sign on the shoulder, which is a little harder to read. So these are the orphans. We don't have money to maintain them. We don't have money to replace them. Uh, and it's not a requirement by Federal Highways to inspect them. Yeah, I was just kind of curious. How did you link a bridge hit to bridge cleaning? A bridge hit to bridge cleaning. I had a lot of questions asked uh, yeah. of me of that bridge hit, and I said, well, the problem is you don't run trucks into your bridges. <laughs> <laughs> I, never was, uh, I never thought about linking it to a preservation program. Well, because we had to fix it, we had to, we were bringing in this, for all intents of Bailey Bridge, we had to clean it up. And as we cleaned all the dirt, we noticed that the rivet heads were rusted away, 
So they started cleaning more and more and more and finding the same thing all the way through. So he's saying, well, you need to do something about this. So okay, give us the money, we'll go do it. So we got $2 million to kick it off, $2 million per biennium, $1 million a year. Right away we figured out we didn't have enough bridge ass, the underbridge inspection trucks, so we had to carve out $660,000 million, $60, for a new UBIT. Next year we decided to rebuild one of the bridges because it was, just came available for about $400,000. So Mainus now has two underbridge inspection trucks so we can access the different parts of the bridge. Uh, Eastern Washington, they would hire people just to do the bridge washing. The other crews fitted in with their normal work. And we did it, and they had to replace all those rivets with high-string bolts on Skagit. And now we're trying to address the bridges. And we found out once you clean them the first time, after 20 years or more, they stay fairly clean unless you have birds. Also, of that $2 million, quarter million dollars of that, I paid to the US Department of Agriculture to take care of the pigeons and starlings and other unwanted beasts upon our bridges. So I think it's well worth the money. 